Well, good morning and welcome back. I'm glad you've joined us for our continuing study this fall titled Portrait of the Savior. And as we took a break for Thanksgiving, I hope you had a great celebration with your family and friends as you reflect on all the things that God has done for you and is continuing to do as he walks with you and meets the needs in your life. Well, as we continue forward now, let's open in prayer. And as we do, I'd like to remind you that as always, if there's a need in your life, uh, something we can help with. If you need somebody to listen, if you have questions that you'd like answered, if you'd like uh, somebody to come alongside and pray with you, we would love to be a part of meeting that need and of walking with you through whatever God's doing in your heart, your life uh, during these days. And so we're here for you. Get in touch. We'd love to follow up with you and connect with you that way. Well, let's pray together as we look into God's word together this morning. Father, we thank you again and praise you for who you are. And as we think back on this Thanksgiving season, we thank you again for the many ways that you meet our needs and guide our steps. Uh, we need you. We rely on you for everything. And we, we thank you for the way you care for your people. And now, as we gather here this morning, uh, our hearts and minds have many things uh, weighing us down and, and concerning us. Uh, the attention of our world has been focused on the Middle East again with the war between Israel now and Hamas and everything going on in Gaza. Uh, we think of, of that whole situation and just the mess that it is and the suffering that's going on. We think of, of Afghanistan uh, recovering from these earthquakes and desperately needing help. India with the flooding, uh, Ukraine with the war that has been unleashed upon them by Russia. Uh, here in Canada, tensions between people and, and different polarized groups. Uh, Father, whatever the situation, we need peace. We need peace. We need help. We need hope. And it all comes from Christ. The bottom line is, whatever side and all of these issues people are on, we all need Jesus. There is one Messiah, one Christ, one Savior, one rescuer, one way to be right with you through your Son. We thank you for sending him so that we could have forgiveness and life in his name. And Father, we are calling on you today uh, to continue your work. We know that you work throughout history amongst the nations, bringing up rulers and taking them down, raising up empires and removing them. Uh, you do all of these things to accomplish your purposes. And so we don't understand so much of what's going on, but we do trust you. We know that you are in control. So we rely on you this morning and we call out asking you for peace, for help, for healing, and for just your presence to be known in all of these circumstances, whatever they might be, whether they're big picture like this or whether they're the individual situations in our lives. We pray that you would lift our hearts and our eyes to you. Remind us of how fragile this life is. Remind us of how dependent we are on you for everything. Help us to praise you as you ought to be. Help us to approach you through your Son as, as the only way that we can. And Father, we ask that you would continue to meet our needs. There are those around us and among us who are ill and facing pain and discomfort and, and ongoing health challenges. Father, we pray that you would give them relief and comfort today. Remind them of your presence. We pray for your healing touch in their lives. And uh, we pray for those that are dealing with relational tensions, with uh, financial pressures, with huge decisions before them uh, that need to be made and this need for wisdom. Whatever our circumstances, Father, would you guide our steps and show us how we can be a support and a help to one another along the way as well. And now, Father, as we come to your word, we need to hear from you. And so we pray that you would speak clearly, help us to hear what you have to say. By your spirit, plant your word deep in our hearts, our minds, and our lives, and bring a response that would be honoring to you. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, this past week, the world's attention has certainly been focused again on Israel and Gaza in the war with Hamas. Individuals and nations and various groups of different kinds have, have all lined up on one side or the other, uh, either, either announcing this online or having rallies, whatever it is, uh, people have been very polarized again, one side or the other. Anger growing and intensifying, threats made, uh, along with the fear of a widening war. What will happen if if this group gets involved? What will happen if this country gets involved? What will this nation do? In, in, will it all unfold into a wider war? All these things. And as a result, a lot of questions have been coming up 
about prophecy? What does the Bible say about all of these things? We know that the Bible has a lot to say about the future, about Israel, uh, about that part of the world, and about God's end time plan as he brings history as we know it to its conclusion and to its planned end as he enters in the way things will be for eternity. And so a lot of questions come up, both inside the church and, and from outside. We get questions from people saying, what, what does the Bible say about this? Where is this going? Is this the end? Are we close? Well, the answer is, I don't know. I mean, we're closer than we were uh, last week. <laughs> we're closer to the return of Christ, but I, I don't know God's timetable. We don't have that calendar. Jesus did tell us in Matthew 24, verses 6, 7, and 8, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Things are just starting. And it seems like, not just every generation, it seems like every, every few years we have a round of this new conflicts arising, and famines and earthquakes and things happening, and it makes us ask, is this the end? And, and that's a good thing. That it has us looking to the Lord, to his answers. So I don't know what the plan is in God's calendar. I do know this. Isaiah 52, verse 7 tells us this. And this is speaking about God's servant, Jesus Christ, the, the promised one who was to come. In this prophecy about the coming of Christ, we read this. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. This passage points us to God through Jesus. It points us to Jesus through the plan of God and the provision of God. And it, it, I do know this. As God's people, we need to pray for peace. As God's people, we need to trust him with his plan. And as people, period, it doesn't matter whether you are Israeli or whether you're a Palestinian, whether you're part of Hamas or not. Whether you're a Canadian or an Afghani, Ukrainian or Russian, uh, it, it, we all need Jesus. There's one way to be right with God, and that's Jesus. And so we need peace with God that comes through Christ. And so we need to be people who point to Jesus. And so today we continue this series. And we'll look at a passage that deals with the end, its future, but we will see Jesus again in another portrait that God paints for us in his word of his son. And as we do, we're reminded that the questions about the end, they're not about the details, the what, the when, the where, the how. The questions of the end have to do with the who. Who is the deliverer? Who is in charge here? Who rules and will rule? And whose side are we on? Those are the questions that need to be answered. So let's look today at God's portrait of Jesus once again as we enter, look into his word. And we're turning now to Revelation chapter 4. The background here is obviously Revelation 1, 2, and 3. In Revelation 1, the Apostle John has showed the, the resurrection, the resurrected Christ, the glorified Jesus. He sees him in his glory, and he's just overwhelmed, as you can imagine. Then he hears from Jesus these letters, these messages that Jesus, seen standing amongst his churches, these letters that he dictates to these seven churches in Asia Minor. And he dictates these to John, and John copies them down. And now... Next, we read this in chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I'll show you what must take place after this. This is the voice of Jesus calling him into this open door here in heaven. And at once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders, clothed in white garments, with golden crowns on their heads. Golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, and rumblings, and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. 
the first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns, these golden crowns, they take them off. Why? Because in his presence they have no authority. They are humbling themselves before him. They are worshiping him, submitting to his rule. And they take off their thrones, their, their crowns and they cast them before his throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. And here, along with Isaiah chapter 6 and Ezekiel chapter 1, we are given one of these rare, awesome glimpses into the throne room of heaven. John, the apostle, is shown the throne room of heaven. He sees it as he is. He sees God on his throne. He sees the creatures there. He sees the angelic host there. It's absolutely amazing and overwhelming, as you can imagine. How could he possibly try and describe it? And, and it's just absolutely perfect. It's literally the perfect setting. It, it's amazing. And John is overwhelmed with it and amazed by it, as you and I would be. How absolutely perfect. You would think there could be nothing that would go wrong there, that everything is right as it should be, and it is until, until it isn't. John sees a moment coming up, still future, when there will be a problem in that setting. Take a look at chapter 5, verse 1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Here's this scroll. It's been described as the title deed to the earth. It's the, the decrees of God's final dealings with men, his judgments upon the earth. Uh, these, these scroll is there in the hand of God, and the angel calls out, who is worthy? Who anywhere in heaven, in earth, under the earth, who anywhere is worthy to open the scroll? Not who's physically able, they're wax seals. It's not about physical ability, it's about authority. It's about who's qualified, who is deserving, to whom will God hand this and say, yes, you may open this. Who is worthy of this? And the answer is, no one. No one. And so John just, he's weeping the plans of God after all of humanity from the beginning of his first speaking creation into existence. It all comes to a screeching halt in this moment. There is no one found worthy to open the seal and John stands and weeps in this setting. Will all of it come to naught? Will, will this all be destroyed and, and be upended, God's great plan? And this is where we step back into the gallery. Remember the gallery we've been walking through of these portraits of the Savior? We began with that entryway where, where God introduced his son to us, Jesus. And then we stepped into that first room filled with pages, uh, filled with paintings rather, painted by God, portraits of Jesus as the good shepherd. Oh, remember that? Are you still walking with your good shepherd, the good shepherd? Are you following him daily? And then we stepped from there into the next room. And that room of the gallery showed all these courtroom settings with Jesus as our advocate, standing at the right hand of God. Oh, are you still relying on him? Are you trusting him? Is he there as your advocate? Or are you determined to stand before God on your own merits? Remember, he, he goes as the, as the good shepherd and our advocate now. These layers continue to pile up and we walk into this next room and here's what we see. One of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Amazing. There is one who is able. There is one who is worthy. There is one who has authority. Why? Because he has triumphed. He has conquered sin and death and hell. And he is there and he is able and he is worthy. And God will give him the authority to do just that, to take this scroll and to open it. And who is this? 
this lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And Genesis 48 talks about this and tells us about Judah as the lion. As, as Jacob, Israel, blesses his sons before he dies, he, he speaks to each of his sons who will each lead one of the tribes of, of Israel. And he speaks to Judah. And in verse 8, he says, Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son shall bow down before you. You will be the, the tribe that rules the nation. And from within you will come the one who leads everything. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down. He crouched as a lion and as a lioness. Who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Speaking of this perpetual royal dynasty that will come from Judah, this fresh shoot here, this root of David, we'll talk more about that in Isaiah 11 next week. And that again is Jesus so this is talking to us of Jesus, who is the lion of the tribe of Judah, and he has conquered. And in Greek, in the original language here, in this sentence, this concept of this word of, of triumphed or conquered, it comes first in the sentence for emphasis. It's, it's um, it, he has conquered this lion of the tribe of Judah, therefore he's worthy. This emphasis on what he has done. He's worthy. He has the right. He's been given authority to open this scroll and to enact its decrees, to, to begin this last chapter of history as we know it, to complete the unveiling of the Son of God, Jesus himself, and the plan and purpose of God. Why? Because he made this possible. He conquered, and it, he made it all possible, and, and this is about him ultimately. And so John is incredibly relieved. Oh, he stops weeping and he gathers his composure and he looks at the, the hand on his shoulder of that elder and he's like, oh, thank you for that word of comfort, my friend. And he looks to where this elder's pointing and he looks to see the lion of the tribe of Judah. And we find in verse six, and between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a, a lamb. He, he's looking for a lion, but I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So what happens? God paints this portrait for us of the lion of the tribe of Judah, this victorious lion. And so we, like John, are thinking royalty. We're thinking dignified. We think majestic, powerful, the ruler. Uh, I have a number of pictures in my living room painted by a Canadian painter out of Niagara-on-the-Lake named Edward Spera. And he, these different paintings of, of lions and you know with the scars on their faces from past, fat, past battles. But this authoritative majestic fierce look in their eyes and whichever way you stand the eyes just seem to follow you and they're, they're fantastic paintings we love to look at them regularly and here we have this this image in our hearts and minds and that's what John's thinking as he looks for this lion of the tribe of Judah and instead he sees a lamb a lamb who's quiet at first and submissive and humble but also it it's beat up it looks like it's been slain, slaughtered, killed, and yet it's alive again. Here's Jesus. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah, but he's also the lamb of God, my friends. And here he is as this slain and yet living again lamb. And he's got these seven horns on his head. That's describing his authority and power. And in chapter 6, we'll read this in verse 15. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? Who can stand? That is a great question. The day of the God's wrath is coming, the judgment that, that Jesus will bring, this lamb. Wow. So it's speaking of his authority. Yes, he's the slain lamb who's, who's returned to life, and here he is. And, and he's got this authority, and he's got these eyes, the sevenfold spirit of God, the spirit that sees all and misses nothing. And he's the lamb of God. In Abraham and Isaac, remember that encounter? 
as they go up the mountain and Abraham is called on to sacrifice his son and, and then God stops him and provides the lamb. Remember in Genesis 22 verse 8, Isaac says, Father, we've got the, the wood for the sacrifice, the altar. We've got the, the, the torch with the fire to, to ignite it. But, but where's the sacrifice? What did Abraham say? My son, God himself will provide the lamb. And he did that day. And he would in that same place so many years later when Jesus died right then, right, right there in our place to pay for our sin. Isaiah 53 verse 7 speaks of Jesus as the lamb being led to the slaughter, calm and quiet. Jesus as a sheep before its shearers is silent. He's silent and compliant. John 1 29, when, when, the, when the, John the Baptist rather sees Jesus walk by, he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, the Apostle Paul describes Jesus this way. He says, Christ, our Passover Lamb, has been sacrificed. Sacrificed for our deliverance. So he is God's Lamb, but our Passover Lamb. Our sacrifice. Remember the Passover with the Jews enslaved in Egypt? And God said, slaughter a lamb. And this is why they celebrate the Passover meal. Slaughter this lamb and put the blood on the doorpost. And if you trust that, that I my promise is true, that anyone who does this act of faith will be saved and spared from the judgment to come and will be then delivered out of Egypt. The whole exodus beginning with the Passover. This is what he's relating this to. This was all pointing to the ultimate ex exodus and deliverance through Jesus. And he's saying Jesus is our Passover lamb. He's the only one through whom we can receive forgiveness and, and life and restoration and adoption into God's family to be spared from the wrath to come at the hands of this lamb and of God himself in the end. 1 Peter 1.18 tells us, that uh, we were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from our forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blot or, sp or blemish, spot or blemish. He is absolutely perfect. His victory, the victory of the line of the tribe of Judah, came in the form of this being this lamb, this sacrifice, his death and resurrection, his sacrifice and slaughter, and where he stands now. Did you see where he is? In Revelation chapter 5, he's between the throne and the four living creatures. Well, I thought nothing was closer than the four living creatures. Oh, yes, there's one. Jesus, our advocate, the great shepherd is standing right there as our advocate at the, at the right hand of the Father, right there at the throne. And he is the lion of the tribe of Judah who's conquered, and he is the Lamb of God who paid for our sin and rebellion. And the Lamb comes and he takes the scroll. He doesn't rip it out of God's hands. He stands out his hand, hands out his hand, and God gives it to him. You have the authority and right. I'm giving that to you. And he gives him the scroll and the Lamb will start to break those seals, and each one will start to unleash the judgments of God upon the earth. But as he takes that scroll, we're told that he's worshipped. The four living creatures and the 24 elders fall down before the Lamb. They have, who have, in chapter 4, been singing and praising the one on the throne, they now turn and they start to praise the Lamb. They start to worship him. He is worthy. He made it possible, and this is all about him. Verse 12 will say, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. He is worthy, and so they turn and praise Him. And so I ask you today, before we leave this gallery, are you, as we stand here, we see Jesus, the great Lion of the tribe of Judah, who will come again to rule and to reign in judgment. The Lamb of God who paid for us and was sacrificed for our forgiveness, who will come as the lion to bring judgment and wrath upon sin and rebellion upon this world. He is both lion and lamb. Do you see him clearly for who he is? Can you appreciate the multiple layers to who Jesus is and, and what he accomplishes, he alone? But do you also see yourself there? Look at verse 8. And the 24 elders each fell down before the lamb and each holding a harp and golden bowls of full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Who are the saints? The saints aren't a few hand-picked select people throughout history who, who seem extra special to us. No, 
Saints are the sanctified ones, the set apart ones, the rescued people of God through Jesus Christ. If you're a follower of Christ, you are a saint, a set apart one, called to be his own. And the prayers of the saints, the prayers of God's people, reach to the very throne room of God and are served up in worship. Did you see that? Every prayer for repentance, every prayer for forgiveness, every prayer for peace, every prayer for help and provision, every prayer of grace, of gratitude and thanks, every prayer uh, pleading for mercy and grace, every prayer pleading for that family or or a uh, family member or loved one, friend who needs Christ, every plea for help in these terrible situations, plea for wisdom, every prayer honoring him, every prayer makes it to the throne room of heaven and is offered up as worship. And remember, the Spirit of God is, is, part, is one of our advocates, and so we saw that last time in, in ushering up these prayers and, and even when we don't know how to pray as we should, we pour out our hearts and he, he words them the way they ought to be worded and delivers them there to God. Friend, your prayers matter. If you're a follower of Jesus today, you keep pouring out your heart. Surrender to God in worship through prayer. Follow his plan. Seek his wisdom and leading through prayer. Praise him for who he is. Plead for others. Uh, uh, pour out your needs before him in prayer. Your prayers matter and they make it to the very throne room of heaven. Does that make you want to get back on your knees this week and keep praying, keep worshiping, keep pouring out your heart? Oh, it should. It should. Well, this is God's portrait of Jesus, the lion who is the lamb. And as we, we leave the gallery, as always, we want to sneak back into the back of that building and go into the studio. We want to say, well, we've seen how Jesus is portrayed by the Father. How now do we portray him to others? What portrait of Jesus are we painting with our words? And with our lives, as we present him to those around us, how are we representing him and presenting him? Well, look at verse 9. And they sang a new song. This is the, the 24 elders saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. And this worship that continually goes on at the throne of God, this worship of the Father now expands and includes the Son, the risen Lamb, the sacrificed Lamb, the one who was worthy to open the scroll. And we have this picture of Jesus being worshipped there by all as he prepares to open that scroll. Oh, what a day that's going to be. What a moment John was given a glimpse into. So what picture of Jesus do you paint and show to others with your words as you speak about Jesus and with your life as you follow Jesus? Some like to focus on the judgment of Jesus as the lion they like to yell at the people around them about their sin and the coming judgment. They want to keep yelling and yelling, and, ah, putting people down, accusing people and attacking people. And they like that, that, that version, uh, that view of Jesus. The problem is that's not the full picture. Others want to focus only on the lamb, the lamb who was surrendered and sacrificed for us to provide forgiveness. And, and, and they just want to say, oh, he's just, he's just loving and forgiving. And we just want to present that. The problem is that's not the full picture either. Jesus is both lion and lamb. He does rule and he will rule forever. He is the judge and he will judge fully and finally and fairly and completely all of us. But he is also the lamb who was sacrificed for us. And until that moment he returns to judge, he extends mercy and grace and says, come follow me, come follow me. And what you will find standing beside that throne is your advocate, the lamb, ready to welcome you home, not the lion ready to prosecute the case against you when you arrive. You need to be ready by embracing the lion who conquered as the lamb 
who was sacrificed for you and offers you forgiveness in life. He is both, and we must present both. We have to live like he is both the ruler and the judge, and we need to honor him and live for him. And we need to live like he is the lamb, and we're not trying to earn God's favor somehow, but we are just humbly grateful for his forgiveness through Christ. We need to live like he's both. We need to talk like he's both. Yes, we need to warn people about the judgment to come, but we need to remind people of the grace of God extended through his son right now. So through our words and our lives and the way we even interact with each other as followers of Christ, are we reflecting and repeating this song? Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God? from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and glory and honor and blessing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Is this the song that we sing? We're told here that in that moment they will sing this new song, those gathered around the throne. New songs, when we see new songs in the history of God's people, new songs in the history of the scriptures, we, they were composed and sung to mark and celebrate new moments, new events in which God has stepped in and rescued his people. In Exodus 15, Moses and Miriam sang this new song after the Exodus, after God delivered the people from Egypt. In Isaiah 42, verse 10, we have this new song of the servant who was to come, Jesus, the Messiah who was to come and rescue us. Psalm 96 speaks of that. Here's a new song. Sing to him a new song. Why? What has he done for you? How has he worked in your life? Sing to him praises about that. Honor him. Give him the glory he's due for how he's worked. And this, my friends, this is the ultimate rescue. This is the ultimate exodus, taking us from death to life, from darkness to light, coming and finally rescuing us fully, bringing us home. This lion who has conquered as the lamb who was slain. This then is the ultimate new song. This is the song. And we want to join in worship by singing his praises now. We just can't wait until we see his glory. We want to glorify him now and sing his songs of praise now. We want to make him known now because the gospel can't wait. In that moment, the lamb will be ready to come in judgment as the lion. And we, we don't, that'll be too late then. You, we don't want to wait because people will then be standing facing the wrath of God on their own if they have not surrendered to Jesus. And so we point to the mercy and grace of Jesus, of God, who sent his son Jesus to be sacrificed as the lamb, who conquered as the lion, conquered sin and death and hell for us. This sacrificed lamb will return as the lion to rule and to judge, which will you face? When it's your turn to stand before your maker, and you will, we all will, will you see the tender, welcoming eyes of the lamb saying, oh, that one's mine. I was sacrificed for them. They trusted in my, in my death, my payment for their rebellion, and they now stand in my righteousness. They've come to you, Father, the only way they can through me. They're with me. They're mine. I'm their advocate. I've been their good shepherd. I've led them all the way home. I am the lamb who was sacrificed for them. And will he welcome you in? Or will you look and see the piercing, blazing eyes of the lion of the tribe of Judah who has conquered and is ready to judge justly, fairly, fully? Wow. Which will you see? Oh, embrace Jesus, who is the returning lion, but he's also the sacrificed lamb. Come to him. Come to him. Do you worship Jesus as you should, as the Lord that he is? Do you worship him with your life? Have you surrendered to him? Have you turned your back on doing things your own way and say, it said, you are Lord, I am not. I trust what you've done for me as the, as the son of God sacrificed for me. I trust your forgiveness. I have received the eternal life that only you can bring. And I surrender my life to follow you as the Lord that you are. Do you live day to day as though something or someone else other than he is worthy of worship? It's a good check, isn't it? Whoa, what do I live as though it's worthy of worship? Who do I treasure as though they're higher than Jesus on the scale? No, no, we're to worship him alone. Finally, am I telling others about the lion, about the lamb, or both, both? Worthy is the lamb who was slain.
to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. To him who sits on the throne, to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever in that moment to come and into eternity and in these moments, in these days, from our lips and from our lives. Are you in?